welcome back to the Bloom Talk series and thanks for joining us once again. Now don't forget, we want to see your own gardens this weekend. So we're running a competition with RTE to give away six vouchers for your nearest garden centre worth 500 euro each. So post a picture or a video using the hashtag Bloom at Home and tag Bloom's social media accounts. Well, the next talk in the series focuses on urban gardening and how you can savour the benefits of gardening from your garden or balcony, no matter how small. Well, we're joined by Bloom Manager and RT Super Garden Judge, Gary Graham, content creator, Nadiel Erfordousi, and presenter and cookbook author, James Kavanagh, to hear about what urban garden gardening means to them. If you've got any questions for our three guests, you can submit them via Slido on boardbeabloom.com. Gary, let me start with you, because I'm sure you've experienced in gardens of all shapes and sizes. Tell us a bit about how people can make the most of a small balcony, a roof garden, or even a tiny outdoor space. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting when you look at the small gardens, okay, from a design point of view. And I won't get into too much of the design principles, but unlike the big gardens, you have to be selective. You know, you can't cram it all in. So. When people kind of realise that and they kind of focus on, well, what's really important to me? You know, do I need somewhere to sit? Is it, you know, is it mm. just a view out, out to what's, what's beyond? Is it growing some veg, whatever? And we'll hear some great examples of that from the guys, what they're do, doing, like, you know, from balconies to rooftops and so on. It's, and if, if you're really into design, you're really interested, you know, it, it's a real challenge because we all have this kind of appetite to have everything. We want, we want it all, don't we? You know, what we see, we, we cover it and so on. So you have to kind of think very cle cleverly about what's important. But the great thing about plants is, because at the end of the day, it's about the plants. There's a plant for everywhere. You know, plants have been uh, adapting themselves to these weird environments uh, for tens of thousands of years. Like they, they didn't start to pivot last year like we did, you know what I mean? Yep. They've been doing this forever. So, so they, you know, no matter what the situation is, how difficult it is, there is a plant that will work and will do a fantastic job and it will be comfortable there and it will look great if it's the right plant. So you just need a little bit of little bit of information on what you're putting up. So you guys, will, I'm sure, will talk about that, you know, where some stuff just doesn't work. It doesn't really matter if you, know, you have a few failures. But you have to look at the plant selection and if you get that right, you can create something that's really special because it's a little bit different if you're out in the leafy suburbs or down, or down the country, you know, you've got this lovely green everywhere that Fiume was talking about earlier. But if you're in the built environment and there's a lot of concrete you know there's a lot of metal and glass even the smallest tiniest green space becomes an oasis and, and these guys have had the experience it's fantastic to see what, what they've done that little space can can actually transform you you know it brings you back to nature and in those small little spaces um there's nothing else that compares it. You know, you, you can go to the park, you can walk and you walk around and you you'll take it all for granted but to bring that into where you live and to have that beside you, and you're doing the bloody Zoom calls or whatever all day, and you can look out at it or step into it or step up on, onto it, like, like in the roof situation, that's where it's really powerful. So you just focus on the plants. You can obviously have a look at our information, all the stuff we spoke about earlier, you know, the, the dream gardens. There's a lot of great lists of plants in there. And if you're working up on the roof or on the balcony, you just have to be a little bit technical in terms of weight that you don't going to put something hugely heavy up there and you've got to drag it up there in the first place and think a little bit about wind and exposure. All the things you would think about in any kind of a garden, I guess, but you just need to give it a little bit more consideration. And if you can do that, you know, and think a little bit cleverly about how am I going to use the space and what plants can I really kind of milk, if you like. So if you want to have um, trailing plants, plants in baskets, containers, you know, as, as you often would on, on a balcony or somewhere, you think and say, well, I've only got so much space, so how can I be clever here? So let's use a plant, say like, I don't know, tomatoes, trailing tomatoes, for example, people wouldn't, wouldn't think of it. You can have fruit and you've got something trailing and that's pretty, nasturtium, of course, and then you, you can bring it in and use it in the kitchen as well, both the leaves and, and, and the flowers. Strawberries, not a great one. So if you look at everything and make sure your plants are kind of multi-purpose, you get a lot more value out of it. Um, as I said, just be a little bit careful in terms of the technical stuff. You don't want to put too much weight up there or have that problem of dragging stuff up and down. But if you do that, those little spaces can really be a lifesaver. And we know that, you know, from our experience over the last 14, 15 months. That's so interesting. All right. And Nadia, your balcony is amazing, you know, and I think we're going to have a picture soon now of all the house plants and the vegetables you have there. Where did your interest come from? When did it begin in doing this in plants? I really only began last year during lockdown. So pre 
March last year, I was traveling full time for work and I kind of just had all of this free time suddenly and I needed to fill it with something. And um, because I didn't spend much time at home before, my apartment was quite bare. There was really nothing on the balcony, bit of furniture, no plants. Um, so I started to sow some seeds. I did it indoors at first. I, I started to like uh, grow a collection of house plants as well. But it just really gave me a purpose during lockdown, something to do, something to look after. Um, and it's just gone from there. And now it looks completely different now than it did a year ago. Now I think it would be so bare without all the color that I have mm -hmm. and being able to just like pick up the herbs when I'm cooking, which is something that I've really enjoyed as well over the last year. And you feel smug when you have your own uh, basil or like salad leaves to, to add to your lunch. But I feel like a sense of accomplishment having achieved something. Yeah, no, they look absolutely wonderful. How did you decide what to plant? Um, I didn't really have a plan. I kind of just, I couldn't really ever leave the supermarket or garden centre without a plan. So it was just like... It's but, addictive. Yeah, yeah. And you say, no, that's enough. Now that is enough. I can't, I cannot leave here with another plan, but just every week there will be something else. And it's just kind of whatever caught my eye. But no, I didn't, I didn't set out with a plan to do it. It just kind of grew organically. And James, a man of many talents, your roof garden... Incredible, vegetables. When did you start? We started, like Nadia, uh, last summer. Uh, I think we, we were all in lockdown looking for something to do and looking for a bit of nature vibes in your life again. Yeah. Um, now, we, when we talk about space, we, I thought I had nothing to work with. And I looked out one of the windows and I was like, hang on, it's a little bit of a flat roof there. So myself and William went to the garden centre. Now, the thing I think with like planning on what you're going to grow is kind of be realistic. Like we were looking through the seeds and I was like, William, butternut squash is pumpkins. <laughs> like, you know, they're a bit big for what we had so we kind of we looked at what uh, you know what we would use regularly so we planted carrots um, and I was kind of I, I was surprised at how well they did you can plant carrots and potatoes in like a little bucket almost so we planted the carrots and when they kind of came we were able to make carrot top pesto we were able to do lots of bits with the carrots and um, so whatever we grew it was kind of stuff we definitely use every day so we grew loads of different herbs salad leaves um, and it's funny because I adore houseplants but I murder a lot of them regularly um, <laughs> whereas I found um, uh, the, the stuff I was growing outside, it was way more robust. Like we were taking one of the planters away last week and uh, I took it from the wall and out burst all of these salad leaves that had been growing in a crack in the wall. Wow. If I tried to do that, I couldn't. <laughs> so I, I found out, I found I had a lot more luck with the vegetables and stuff like that out, out on the flat roof than some of the more exotic house plants I had inside. And do you feel, like Natalie, do you feel very proud of what you've created up there? Like, it, it, none of them are huge spaces, but like, you've both done so much. Yeah, oh, definitely. And we were, when, you know, when the crops were kind of coming in more regularly, we were kind of guided by them as to what we'd cook for dinner. And you'd go out and you'd be like, I have free carrots. Like, I don't know, you felt like you robbed something, but like, they were yours and you grew them. So that it was very exciting to go and take a little crop of something you grew. We also grew tomatoes really successfully as well from a little grow bag up against a wall um, and I was just so surprised at how easy it was mm. and uh, you know and we got a lot of rain thankfully and rainwater is so good for plants yeah. and I'd actually use some of the rainwater to water my indoor plants because apparently that's quite good I don't know yeah absolutely that. but it's great uh, great to hear him say that because there's yeah. all this mystique isn't there about gardening oh like I don't have the green fingers and you know yeah. if there's all this ta technical yeah. jargon and latin nomenclature God, give me a break like yeah you, you don't need to get into that stuff you just need to give it a go and a few failures so what have you killed a few Plants. Yeah, I learned from killing. I learned from my murder <laughs> space. Yeah, a yeah. lot of trial and error. And like James said, I mm. didn't realise that I could actually do that. And I found it so much more easy than yeah. I ever expected. Yeah. There's, a, there's no such thing as murder of plants, by the way. Okay. Okay. It's not actually a crime. Do you know what I mean? Like it, it's it's organic matter. I felt so, bad anyway. No, you shouldn't feel that bad. Like you, you chop it up, you put it in the brown bin, or you put it in your compost heap if you have a compost heap, and then you use it to grow another plant. Like it, it's like the, the circle of life we were talking about earlier. How do you avoid killing plants? I think we've all mm. been guilty of that. What, top tips. Like, well, you know, you, you, where do you start? You know, obviously, you know, you look, you're looking at, as, as I said, about plants being in the right place. So, you know, you're looking at all of the conditions. And again, go back to the stuff we're, share, we're sharing online and the, and the stuff yeah. around Dream Gardens, because you should do a proper assessment. You know, if you were a designer, you would assess. 
and you'd, you'd look at the aspect, you'd look at the sun, is it not facing, you know, that kind of stuff, is it going to be cold, is it going to be drafty, you know, do I have the pr proper depth of soil, like when you talk about carrots, like people think, oh carrots, oh my god, like I have to have this beautiful, rich, deep soil, don't. no you don't, yeah. a bucket or a pot or something, you know, and, and once, once the roots can go down, that's it, same with um, something like potatoes, I see more potatoes these days grown in a bag, yeah, you know, just, just a you know, simple bag, and, and as you top up the soil to bring it up, like you would earth up your, your, your drills, you're just turning up the bag. You know, there's no real science involved. I, I guess I, I blame pe people like me, actually, you know, the old, <coughs> excuse me, the old kind of crusty gardeners, you know, because we like to kind of show off and mm. talk a, bit, a little bit of Latin now and then, you know, make it all a little bit kind of mysterious. It's actually, it's not, you know. Mm. Do you believe me? I, I, well, I've killed a good few plants, <laughs> indoor plants in my time. They're tricky. Uh, how do you do with your indoor plants, both of you? Yeah, they, they definitely are a little trickier, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, no, they're, they're, they're going okay. <laughs> yeah, I have killed a few. Well, killed the few. images we saw of your plants, I know you were only starting off then, but they look pretty good to me, like, you know, for, for a beginner. Like, there are challenges with, with, with houseplants, I guess, because most of the, the varieties we use, they're all coming, or most of them are coming from the likes of, you know, um, tropical or, you know, mm. um, jungle type environments. I know all those lovely glossy leaf houseplants, yeah. They're not, they didn't start off in Ireland. You know, they're not used to the conditions that we yeah. have. And then we put them in front of a window, you know, and we think that they, if they're baked by sun, they'd be fine. They're not, like in the jungle, they were down at the bottom somewhere. They weren't getting all that life. They're getting a bit of moisture maybe, so you, if you give them a bit of a spritz. Yeah, see, our rooms probably aren't humid enough. They're not. So you, them. Can, you can spritz them, you can, you, you can pull them together, create little plant colonies, and they create their own sort of microclimate, or move them into the bathroom, for example, where it's a little bit steamier, you know, because most of our houses aren't steamy. It's not the jungle, you know. So, it, it, you know, <laughs> it won't, again, so it's, it's back about just knowing where the plant is from, what kind of conditions it would like, and if you can kind of help to create that a bit, you'll have a lot of success. But as I said, there's no such thing as motor. It doesn't matter if a few plants die. Yeah. Oh. Well, I, <laughs> I found, because I'm very forgetful, I put it, water my plants in my Google Calendar, so it gives me oh, a, a, a reminder every week, because otherwise I'd forget. And that's been, that's been quite good. And like you were saying, I have a mister now as well, which is yeah, a new really. thing in my life. And that works on, I love asparagus ferns, and I have oh. some of them in the bathroom. Oh, just, they survive really well in the bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. And often when you, when you are murdering your plants and you Google it, it's... Can it, we stop it, it talking about murdering <laughs> plants? My job is to promote the joys and benefits yeah. of plants, not to kill plants. Uh, no, but when you, when you Google it, then it's so confusing because it's always, you're underwatering or you're overwatering. And you I don't know which one is it, but yeah. it's, it's always so confusing when you look online. Yeah, and, and during lockdown, people overwatered because they were at mm. home for the first time. Yeah. And they, oh, look at that plant, isn't it lovely? I'll give it some water. And they were giving it too much water. Which so is, how much should you water a plant? Uh, it depends on the plant, depends on the size, depend, you know, I mean, you, you, there's no kind of black and white okay. um, answer to that. But, but, but you, you can't just look at the top and say, oh, it looks dry. You have to kind of look at the bottom. Do you, know okay. you have to make sure, because it could be bone dry on the top and it could be nice and moist underneath. And you don't leave it sitting in water. Better to let it dry out completely, okay. as it probably would in the wild, and then water. So just don't keep lashing the water on it. I actually got one of those moisture meters recently. Um, See, there's a like tool a for everything. Yeah. It literally says dry, <laughs> moist, wet. So... <laughs> Okay. That's so good. Yeah. Idiot proof. James, one of our uh, viewers wants to know, they said they saw that lovely picture of yourself and your cat, Diana. Does she have a favourite plant, Diana? She absolutely does. So I, I, uh, I open my front door and she kind of goes down on the steps now and again. And I, I was wondering why she kept nibbling at the grass at the bottom step. And I put it on my story and someone said, actually, cats like grass and dogs, apparently, if they have digestion issues. So now I grow cat grass for her. You can get it in a pet shop, whatever. And it actually looks really nice, cat grass. <laughs> It's a little to, and it grows it in an instant over a week or whatever and it looks nice so it's like a, you could pretend it's a house plant and it's really easy to keep <laughs> but that's definitely her she nibbles at the cat grass now and again when she needs some digestive help and she never does anything she shouldn't do in the plants yeah exactly oh yeah she doesn't know she doesn't oh, use the no. at all she uses her litter for that yeah. stuff she's very well trained actually. very well trained nadia i know as well you're an influencer and you're very well traveled when you go away are there places that have you've taken inspiration from for gardening well, to be honest, I really only started doing my urban gardening since I've stopped traveling. Mm. Um, but I do a lot of hiking, mainly in the Dublin mountains, Wicklow mountains. And because of, I've been doing it now for the full year, we've gone through every season. And a lot of the time we might have to do stretches on the road and me and my friend will be 
peeking into people's gardens and <laughs> taking right. pictures of plants and using those apps that will, you know, identify the names of yeah. plants and thinking, right, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring that home. So I've actually taken more inspiration from the local area really than my travels, but it's probably something I'll notice more now when I hopefully do get back to traveling. Uh, another question for you, James, from our viewers. If you were to go all out in your garden, James, what would your dream garden be? Like if you had a dream garden. Versailles, I'd say. No. <laughs> <laughs> my, no, do you know what my dream garden would be? Like a, I love, like if you ever watch Atonement with Keira Knightley rambling around a little old, mm. like English garden with random wildflowers. Like I love those gardens that look kind of ancient. Mm. So I love, I have loads of the, the bee pollinator, the, the little, uh, they're like little balls and you throw them into seed bombs seed bombs yeah and i love the flowers they grow like native wild irish flowers so i'd love maybe a little fountain vibe and some wild flowers and stuff i don't like gardens that look too kept i like yeah. kind of meadowy Actually. gardens yeah sounds good nadia if you want to know, what's your favorite plant or vegetable to grow? Do you have a favorite plant? Yeah, well, a bit like James, my tomatoes were really successful last year. So that's what I'm kind of focusing on this year. I've done more of them. They just tasted like nothing that you could buy in the shop. I was, I was so surprised, they're so sweet, especially the, the small ones. Mm. Um, I won't go try and say the Latin names, but yeah, the tomatoes definitely is gonna be a big focus this year. And you, the same question, James? I would say I would say our salad leaves. We grew uh, a load of different versions, loads of different types of salad leaves, and it was so successful. And you'd cut some leaves off to use them, and you know, two days later they're kind of grown back again. So I like I like plants that like you feel immediately um, I've done a good job there, and it was easy <laughs> enough. And the salad leaves for me were that. Sounds great, Gary. One of our viewers says, "What tools do you need to start growing your own when you're short on space?" Um, yeah, if you're like, there's not a whole lot required actually. So if you know, like, you know, we're talking about balconies and roof gardens here. So like, I'm, and I'm sure the guys will ho hopefully you'll back me up on this. You know, you, you really only need like a little, a little trail. Or, you know, it's the kind of hand tools. You know, you're not getting into big equipment, so you're not getting into big expense. I don't think I really have any tools. There you are. No, you, know, you could take wild. a spoon from the kitchen if yeah, you need. I have a fork from of, the kitchen. Yeah. There, there you, you are. Go, you know? yeah. There you are. My partner uses her scissors all the time for harvesting. Yeah. You know, like, I do okay. like my mister. I have a gorgeous mister. Oh, it's a mister. Nice. It's it's, it's a water it's a, spray. It's a water spray. Oh, right. Yeah. Spritz the plants. You know, that sounds mister. very clever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it sounded yeah. exotic. Yeah, it's my plant mister. So, so, so there's, there's not very much. So if someone's thinking, oh, this could be expensive, it's not. You could get in at that sort of level, you know. And we heard the guys earlier talking about using seeds and cuttings mm -hmm. and smaller plants. So you could get in at a very low cost. I think containers are important, and it'd be interesting to hear what the guys say about containers because, you know, you if, if you're on a roof or a balcony, you don't have the ground. You don't have a good soil to grow in so you've got to put something there and I know all the lovely little pretty pots are great but then they dry out you know it's yeah. hard to keep them alive and keep them watered. so so good containers I say and, and I probably would recommend you spend money on good containers yeah. and you can bring them with you like if you move home like you've got these plants like your pet cat you keep bringing them from home to home okay on that what kind of containers do you both have a little bit of everything, so like some ceramic, um, some of the bigger plastic ones for tomatoes. And I read something that you wrote recently about go bigger than you th yeah. think you need, because you're going to end up, I didn't know that at the start, you know, I had my tomatoes and small plants, then I had to go bigger and bigger and bigger. So just get a bigger one from the start because the, it holds more mm. water, so you can water them less. So I have a mixture. Yeah, same. I, my favorite ones though are these, uh, planters made from old pallets that my my friend Jeff made me and they're on like legs so they it's for good for drainage and um, that's something I you know I, I didn't think of at the start but obviously drainage is better so they're raised so my, mm. my, my pallet planters they sound great they're expensive as well they are expensive no, inexpensive inexpensive they, yeah, great made of old pallets Sorry, one of our viewers could you recommend some trees for small gardens or balconies yeah I could um it's a good Good question because people think, oh, small gardens, balconies, trees are out of the question. So yeah, it's 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 an interesting one, um, and I guess as I was saying about all plants, there's a, you know there's a, there is a plant for everywhere. There are trees for everywhere. So if you're if you're you're down on the ground, you're not up on the balcony or you know or on the roof, and you can plant into the soil and it's a small space. There are you could go and I won't start listing them all off and all the Latin because that's the kind of stuff that I think people go on. Oh, come on, enough, <laughs> you know. But if you go through the list, look at our stuff, the list we have, and all of the gardens have suggestions on small mm. trees. Uh, or call into the local garden centre and they have even even more much long, longer lists. But if you go through nearly all of the species, and people never never really kind of understand this, in nearly every species that you look at. 
there's a tree that, that somewhere in the world had to survive in a small space, you know? Mm. Like, like you're talking about your salad leaves, you know, finding you know, life in the, in the crack in the, of a wall. So like there are cherries, apples, pears, you know, there's uh, roan trees, there's Japanese maples, like it just goes on. So you, but you just have to, not, not just any Japanese maple, not just, you have to make sure it's one of those varieties that's suited to a small space. So there's no end, end of trees you can put in a small garden. On the balcony, it gets a little bit more interested around the roof because you've got the wind, mm -hmm. you've got, you know, you've got a lot, a lot less space. But there are trees that go on balconies and, and what I'm not, don't like to get into specific names, I will in, in this case, because we have a guy uh, here in Ireland actually who bred uh, coronet apple trees. And what he did was he kind of made them like, like almost like a bonsai. So he kind of topiarized them and he pruned the roots and whatever. And now you can grow them on your patio and you can have two or three varieties of apples on one little dwarf tree sitting on your patio or on your roof. So, so yeah, there's a tree for every situation. Would you like an apple tree? Now I want an apple tree. No, no, yeah. I'm thinking what of <laughs> making homemade. So we going home home and... <laughs> yeah. Um, Gary, another question to you. When do you know if a plant has outgrown a pot? Uh, you'll find it very hard to get water into it and to, and to keep it going. If you, best thing, you, you kind of need to get up close and personal with plants. And you guys, have, you know, you, you kind of mm. need to lift it up, feel the weight, pull the plant out of the mm -hmm. pot. Don't be nervous of it and look at the root system. And when you start to see the roots circling at the bottom, you know then it's what we call pot bound. You know, and that's when you go up to your bigger size. I've seen pot. that with one of my, one of my house plants recently. Yeah. yeah, put it into the, I really thought it was gone, but put it into the bigger pot and now it's absolutely thriving. Yeah. That's so interesting. Uh, James, one of our listeners, do you ever give plants as gifts? Yeah, all the time. And I, I've had a good few people that have moved house over the last year or so, and I always bring a plant. I think a plant is a lovely gift, definitely. Yeah, we, 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 we see that at Bloom where people, you know, it's not just any plant. You know, I got that from such a person or, or yeah. auntie, whatever. Um, and it's, it just, it adds more value. It makes, the, you know, the plant more personal, I think. And when you associate it with a person, especially if someone you like or lo love that's in, in your family. And it's funny, because I'm going to plug something here. There's a new thing starting next week called um, uh, Pledge Your Plants, I think it's called. Um, a woman called uh, Kathy White starting. And, and it, with this new initiative, basically we're all being asked, like if you've got some spare seeds or little plants or something, you know, that you want yeah. to share, um, you give them away to someone, right? So rather than having to go and buy it, and then they can make a donation to the Hospice Foundation. Okay. It's a lovely idea. So we're hoping to have that garden to, to show this new idea at Bloom next year. That's a lovely idea. Plants, we'll all be plants. there next year in the sun. Oh, bring it on. Yes. Bring it on. Um, now, Nadia, and I will ask James the same question. Everyone has failures, especially when you're starting off. Um, what was your worst disaster or failure in terms of your balcony? I would say I had two big hydrangea plants and they were doing great last year. And one has come back this summer. And the other one, I was thinking, the water was just filling up, filling up. And I was going, why, what's happened to this one? I realized there was no drainage. There was no hole in, in the pot the whole time. So oh. it's completely dead. And the other one is just blooming. So I actually then just drilled a hole in, in oh. the bottom of the pot. And we're OK now, but I just oh. didn't think. That's so a, that, that, can I come in there? Because yeah. that, that's a, re a really good point because we're talking about containerized gardening here, essentially, you know, and people don't some realize sometimes some containers are designed to look ornamental, to be ornate, and there's no holes in the bottom and you might bring them inside and that's why there's no holes in the bottom because you don't want water going everywhere yeah. over your floors or your carpet. But if you plant in that, and then you put it out in the back on the roof, it just fills with, with, with water. Yeah, the rain, it was just yeah. completely waterlogged. So, so you have to have a plant with drainage. It's really, oh, really, uh, excuse me, a pot with drainage, really important. Really interesting. James, your private disasters? Um, I, uh, my precious salad leaves. So, you know, Dublin seagulls, they're like the size <laughs> of dogs. <laughs> and for some reason, the seagulls wanted the salad leaves over anything else. So we had, t t uh, there was particular seagulls, about three of them came and destroyed the salad leaf box. And so we kind of had to start again. But I got a, a, like a piece of cheap netting um, and that completely put them off. So if you do have a problem with maybe hungry seagulls near you, I find a little piece of netting over, over whatever plant they're going for helped, me, helped us anyway. Have you enjoyed Nadia? You know, people were talking about difficulties for everyone during the pandemic, but the fact that you did this, you did your balcony, did you find it quite therapeutic? Like, did you find it was very good, even fine for your mental health? No, absolutely, because it, it gave you, or gave me this, yeah. this purpose, you know, I, I had to keep these things alive. It was something that I had to mm. do on a continuous basis, you know? Mm. And now 
I definitely continue, even if I do go back traveling. It's going to be tricky. I'll have to figure out ways to water the plants when I'm away. But even just being out there when I'm repotting or sowing seeds, just with some music on, away from your phone as well. It's probably one of the only times I'm not on my mm. phone. Yeah. It's been really therapeutic, definitely. You, James? Um, 100%, yeah, it kind of, I think going back to nature in general is so therapeutic. I'm quite lucky, my boyfriend's from Cork, so I'd spend a lot of time down there, and that's the total opposite where I'm from. I'm from Nookrow, very built up area, Dublin, and... Good go, shopping centre. Good shopping centre, the best. <laughs> so I found, uh, I, I found having a little space on our roof reminded me of being down in Cork and being in touch with nature, so yeah, totally relaxed me. Final question to you, Gary, because we're about to wrap this now. For anyone watching, just give them more hope. If it's a small space, if it's a balcony, a rooftop, just a small space, that they can do great things there in terms of their garden. Yeah, they, they can. Like, even if I say we look at the Bloom Show, and we've got the country's top designers there, and we really have. We have, we know we've we've have such such talent there. We've had it there for we would have it there for 15 years if we were in the parks. There we've had it there for 13 years, and if you went through their CVs, shall I say, some of them started and had absolutely no knowledge, no training, no nothing in in horticulture. But they, you know they started like these guys. Just you know, yeah. somehow they had nothing else to do, or they got stuck at home. You know there was a lockdown, whatever. Uh, well, this is pre-pandemic, I guess. Um, and once I think once you get going, you get started. You know you do get that bug, and you know it's great to hear you talk about that sense of achievement. And I see that. I certainly saw that with my kids, you know, where, you know, sowing a seed, like, it's, you know, it's, it's that kind of act of faith, you know, of, of yeah. you know, eternal optimism and to see that kind of actually growing and then turning it into food. Like, so it's hugely rewarding. So if anyone makes any kind of a start at, at any kind of level, yeah. don't and never be afraid to ask the stupid questions, you know, never like, you know, go, go to the garden centre, go wherever they have. And we have great knowledge uh, around the country or indeed you use the information we have up online. There's a kind of an entry point, I think, for everyone, you know, and we see more in recent years, it's been about food. Which is, which is great, you know, it, it's, a, it's a great combination. And when you've got that opportunity to grow something that looks interesting and attractive and you can eat it, you've got that double reward. You know, the, the, the mental space issue that you spoke about there in, term, in yeah. terms of wellness and mindfulness, I know we've been talking about that, that a lot today. I think we've seen that as the biggest trend in garden design. Well, people are looking for a sanctuary, they're looking for a green sanctuary, you know, the oasis, which is exactly what you can do, as we were talking about earlier, in, in the urban situation. There's a bigger, a much bigger demand for that. And once you remember, you know, that they're the sort of benefits you can get from it, um, you will go in, you'll make some mistakes, you know, there'll be a little bit of murder, but, you know, yeah. no, no, nothing too much, you know, yeah. and you start to get the rewards. And it is, it is addictive. Like, so I often think as houseplants as being like the gateway drug into gardening, you know, in a good way, you know. Yeah. But, you know, so, so that, and that's what we want. That's what we want people to do, you know. And, and if we do that for ourselves and our families and for the community, like we're talking about noticing neighbours' gardens, I really noticed neighbours' gardens last year. It's fantastic to have that little walk or, or 2K or a 5K yeah. and see what other, other people were doing. Um, but I think, yeah, just just get started. Don't 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 be afraid. Make a few mistakes, you know. And if you see one of your neighbours or someone doing something special or growing something that you really like, go in and ask them, and they'll be chuffed. Oh, they'll be delighted, and they'll give you a bit, you know. Mm. Yeah, great. <laughs> Nally James, uh, just before we go, one of our viewers says, "What do you want to achieve next for your for your balcony? Have you got more plans, or just keep doing what you're doing?" Yeah, no, I just think keep doing what I do. I didn't have a plan at the start, so I like how it's just kind of growing over time. Um, I probably will have to stop at some point because I'll run out of space, so that'll be <laughs> And you, James? I think trying new variants of seeds and, and maybe some heirloom tomatoes or, or trying to expand our, our, our vegetables because we, what we grew at the start was kind of basic. I'd like to try a bit more adventurous stuff now. Gosh, well done. Well, I, actually, I would like to be able to keep basil alive, so that, that would be something. <laughs> if I can do that, then I'll be... <laughs> Is it hard to keep basil alive? No, no. no he'll tell you. <laughs> Help. <laughs> no, we'll sort you out. Well, listen, Gary, thank you so much for today. And Nadia and James, well done to both of you and your great gardens. Maybe we'll see you showcasing at Bloom one day. Maybe. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, thanks, obviously, again to them for sharing their passion and knowledge for growing plants and vegetables. I certainly feel like a nice success if we keep a plant alive. I think so, Gary, anyway. I'm going to be back at four with a talk foodies should not miss, as I'll be joined by chefs Catherine Fulvio and Rory O'Connell, so join us then.